Welcome everyone. Here we are Friday, New York time, 10 a.m., although I am closer to 10 a.m. in Taipei. Here I've arrived in Taipei, Taiwan. This is one of the very few countries which has actually conquered the coronavirus. And I can see that it has done that through great discipline, in fact. After a long delay in San Francisco, actually, I was, took a plane from New York to San Francisco and then to Taipei. And in San Francisco, somehow the plane was 17 hours delayed, but that was not a problem. Uh, I arrived. I had to go through a, a health check, actually. I had to make sure that I had a, a negative COVID test. They actually don't care about the vaccine particularly. That's rather interesting. But perhaps in this early stage, that makes sense. I was picked up by car and driven to the quarantine hotel. This is, it took maybe 20 minutes, something like that, to come to the hotel. Then, this is rather interesting. Uh, I could see a little bit of Taipei through the window of the car as we were driving through the street. Then we came to the hotel, we drove up to the back entrance and opened the door for me. I got out, put the baggage on uh, this little platform next to the rear entryway. A fellow in hazmat suit came out, sprayed the luggage and took my temperature, put the luggage and me in an elevator, I whisked up to the ninth floor, and at the end of the, what was my quarantine room, or I should say my quarantine suite, I had asked for as large a possible a space so that I could uh, teach and practice and not disturb my neighbors. Uh, that has worked out actually quite well. Uh, I cannot complain. And here I am resuming online life, which I had left not at all, in fact. That's, I'd left this online life just for a day, I guess, yeah. Wow. Uh, I must say I was rather nervous taking a trip after having spent more than one year virtually <laughs> quarantined in my home, of course. Uh, but I made it uh, and everything is fine. Uh, I cannot leave this suite for two weeks. In fact, the door is barricaded in a certain sense, not, not in, a, in a terribly uh, strong way, but in a way which if, if I try to leave, it's apparent. And if I do try to leave, then I'm, of course, uh, sent back to the United States. Uh, so I won't. After the two weeks, I have a week of self-care, it's called. I'm not sure what that means, but the one thing that's clear is that I will not be able to have any rehearsals or any kind of uh, in-person teaching or whatever. That's it. But in general, life in Taipei is going about rather normally. That's quite something. Uh, I have to take my temperature twice a day, call the front desk and give it to them. And the police, which are, who are very nice, <laughs> at least to me, uh, call me up once a day and ask me, how am I doing? Am I uh, feeling okay? Do I have any symptoms, etc., etc.? Of course I don't. Uh, this little apartment of mine here is very quiet. It's comfortable. The only thing I can complain about is the food, which is really terrible. Uh, in a country like Taiwan, which is known for wonderful cuisine, uh, here I'm eating or I'm served, I should say, a series of dishes from McDonald's, Pizza Hut, or Rara Burger, whatever. It's really 
quite something. Uh, but food seems to be a general problem in quarantine situations because I just read an article by the BBC uh, which is an expose of terrible quarantine food, hotel food, I should say, quarantine hotel food in England. There's a doctor who had returned from visiting his parents and uh, he was anyway negative, but he was in this quarantine for two weeks and he was complaining bitterly about the terrible food. I don't know why it should be that way, but anyway, these are extremely minor inconveniences. I should say they're not inconveniences at all, especially when I read about the horrific plight of India still, which is an awful shape, and how South America seems to be falling into chaos. So just uh, the other day, 25 people were killed in a shootout in Rio de Janeiro, and 22 people, more than 22 people, have been killed by police in demonstrations in Colombia just now. This is really awful. Uh, and while all of this is happening in the world, Myanmar is, is reverted to its, its previous uh, totalitarian state, I should say, with secret informers and police uh, stopping people randomly on the street and, and uh, anyway, shootings. And it's, this is uh, this late pandemic chaos, I should say, where everything which should have dissipated completely from the world makes its reappearance. Yes, we do live in a kind of zombie world, I'm afraid. Uh, so all of this is happening, and our former president, Trump, is still insisting that he really won the election, and he is urging his base to take action. Uh, Florida has now just added itself to the list of states restricting voting rights. Arizona has a recount, this and that, and it's really rather a dangerous state that we have in the United States, as I see now from afar. However, there is always some kind of positive thing happening. And on a positive note, the Biden administration has it announced that it will support a temporary waiver of intellectual property barriers for COVID-19 vaccines. This is incredibly good news, I think, because it will definitely allow the dissemination of the vaccine in a much more, uh, perhaps let's say democratic way, in a much more thorough way. And in fact, that still, as medical science does agree, the only way that the world will conquer this disease. I have to say, that when I was in the airport in New York and in San Francisco, um, I was really taken aback because there was no social distancing. People were supposed to wear masks, but not everyone was wearing, wearing a mask. Uh, and it was very stuffy. I don't, didn't think there was great ventilation. And uh, there was quite disorganization in, in terms of actually uh, checking in, uh, checking baggage, etc., etc., uh, this is also not very safe in this kind of environment. Well, perhaps I'm too careful, but I think as musicians we have to be because our bodies are our instruments, even if we do play other instruments, and we cannot afford the possibility of something happening to them. That's, uh, I can say that for myself. I feel incredibly good in, in hold it. Anyway, I have my coffee. It's not the same, but it is there.
I'm in, I feel that I'm in very good shape. I can play well. I have great control. I don't know what I would do if I lose this. There are a couple new th other things, I should say, which are kind of interesting, and I, I should mention them, I think, in the, uh, keeping with tradition, we should say. Uh, so current biology reported that scientists have unearthed a billion-year-old fossil in the Scottish Highlands, which suggests multicellular life forms evolved about 400 million years before we, we, we thought before, before the actual emergence of the first uh, organisms, which can be called animals. Uh, it's interesting in the Scottish Highlands. Uh, Scotland, of course, in the 18th century and the 19th century, or certainly earlier in the 19th century, was considered to be the place of mystery and a place very far off in the world. Uh, so we find that perhaps that is actually true at least uh, a billion years ago. I hope I'm, this microphone, this tiny mic that I have here is actually working okay and picking up what I'm saying. I will check it afterwards. Okay, a couple more things. Actually, just really one more thing I think I will, I will uh, mention. And this had to, has to do with painting cows. Uh, now, one reason why cows are injected with antibiotics, it's not, to, not necessarily to foster growth, although that's uh, supposedly uh, one reason for antibiotics, but because of disease borne by biting flies. Now, Japanese researchers have found that by painting zebra-style stripes on one group of cows, the black stripes on another, just regular black or black uh, bodies on another, and another group, third group, unpainted, as you know, when they did that, they found that the cows with the zebra stripes here had 50% fewer biting flies on their bodies than those in the control group. And the black cows, black just sort of striped, in normally striped, and uh, uh, controls didn't were no different. So nature is amazing, okay? and there's a very important reason why zebras have the stripes that they do. And it is thought now that by painting the zebra stripes on cows, you can decrease uh, basic fly biting and fly repelling uh, behavior from at least 20%, and if fewer fly, biting flies are landing on them, they are less bothered by them, and they are less afflicted by disease, which means that they do not require the antibiotics which are being fed to the cows at, the, at present. Uh, this is the end of the article. It says that the, if the results are replicated, artificial stripes could be used as a better way of combating body, body, biting flies. Wow, I'm not good. Why? Biting flies, then traditional pesticides, as they said also. Uh, as well as being cheaper, the stripes are non-toxic and healthier for livestock, as well as better for the environment. That's really great. Okay. Uh, why don't I... I give you a little tour of this palace of mine, since I'm here, uh, before signing off for all of you. So here, I will take this, and I will take the mic also, and attach it to me, somehow. Okay. 
let's say that way. Now going on, this is the back. Then we have a kitchen there with no utensils. These here. I did rent a keyboard because I couldn't imagine being a few weeks without one. Here's the kind of living room area. I decided not to really do much about putting my stuff away. So here are my suitcases, of course. Uh, there's a foyer, the entranceway. I will even show you what is here. It's really it's kind of interesting. There we are. Oops, there, that's the barricade. Okay. There we go. I can open this door here, and this is my bedroom, which I will show you just briefly. So, let's see. It's here. And the final thing I show you is this. This is my companion. I have two of them because this one was broken, so I asked for another one. And here I will demonstrate why I say this is my companion. It's a stepper, very primitive one, and I go here. And here, let me see, how, how, how can I do this? Let's put this this way. Yeah, and here are my steps. And I go here. Oh, we're starting. not cooperating today. Well, that's actually good. Let's see if I can get it to cool. Ah, here it comes. There. It's talking to me. It doesn't want to talk too well now. Anyway, this is my stepper. And my room, and with that, I say goodbye to all of you, and take care. Take care. Hello everyone, I'm back, and I thought that I would do a short, uh, maybe demonstration or explanation of circular breathing, I know that many of you probably, in, who are clarinetists out there, actually can do this, but it's probably worth uh, recapitulating, and also in case you want to teach someone else, and also for little, uh, what do we call them, tips perhaps, uh, of uh, ways which would perhaps make it better for you. Uh, so. Now we go right to the circular breathing. Circular breathing, of course, is a very ancient uh, technique on wind instruments. I wouldn't be surprised if the very earliest bone flute players actually figured out how to circular breathe. Um, the earliest reference in writing that I know of is by Pierre Gabriel Bouffardin, who was the flutist for whom Bach wrote and he could circular breathe, and he mentioned that he learned from glass blowers in Constantinople. Uh, of course, if you're a glass blower, it's very important to circular breathe because if you're in the middle of, of blowing the vase or the glass or whatever you're going to blow, and you lose air, you have to begin again, generally. So, if you can circular breathe, then you can actually continue until the uh, the piece of art or the, the bowl or whatever you are making is actually complete. Okay, so now to circular breathing. Uh, it's not really circular, but okay, maybe ignore circular, and it's not completely breathing because 
what happens is you take enough air in your cheeks and I think it's important to actually be able to inflate the cheeks a lot so don't be shy so like that and then you squeeze that out using muscles around here and in fact a little bit muscles of the tongue and I will explain that and this is one of the important points so here you go and the embouchure needs to resist that resistance is very important because you go nothing happens you see this is just like what I was talking earlier about support is a matter of controlling resistance this way so ideally you should have around three seconds of air within your cheeks and when you're pushing that air out your nose passages nasal passages are free to actually inhale so as you do this you actually can inhale through the nose and the problem we have often with circular breathing that is a psychological one which is that it feels weird to actually have air coming out of your mouth and in through your nose so it's a you know there are many <laughs> worse things in the world than feeling weird about that uh, and we should get used to that and you need patience if you're actually in a beginner stage with this. So, the first thing to do is really just that, with your cheeks puffed out, resisting here, you can actually use the hands to help squeeze. I'm doing the very elementary step, the most basic step. And then, when you can feel that you are out to have the pressure here and you're actually squeezing so the air is coming out like that uh, of course it's best to learn this when you're around two years old of course uh, but we do that then you can feel that you can inhale so what you need to do first is you use your hands start to push and as you're pushing Keep pushing that and inhale. Now, if that's a problem, the first thing you can do is just keep your uh, cheeks inflated and breathe through your nose. And then you do that. Then the next is to somehow connect. So you can still use your hands to do this. So you, you do this first way. And then blow out through, there, through your mouth. Okay. After this, it's probably a good idea to graduate to this cup and water. And fortunately, I don't have a clear cup. I couldn't find one anywhere here. And this comes from my breakfast, Laya Burger. Hmm. <laughs> it says here, adhere to healthy and nature. Uh, somehow, I don't think the company followed its own advice. But if we do this, here, let me... You know, maybe I go, should I go up a little this way? I hope you can see me. So I put here, and I blow through the straw. Ideally, you should have a very small straw. This straw is even perhaps a little too big. That is a very thin straw, I would say, because otherwise too much air goes out at once. So to compensate for that, you can pinch the straw, end of the straw, and in any case, you just take the straw and put it at the edge of your lips. Don't put it inside your mouth. This way, but right at the edge. So you can actually close your mouth. Okay, you're not used to doing this actually when you're playing the clarinet to closing completely. And we will get to that. 
but you close your mouth here. Then you puff your cheeks and you squeeze. And once you can do with the hands, you try to squeeze just with the muscles of your cheeks around here and lips, etc., etc. So here. You just do that and let all the air go through that way. Then, of course, you do the second step. You start, and as you start the, the, the squeezing, after you start the squeezing, you inhale through the air. Okay, once again. Hmm? And let all the air go out. Okay. Once you can do that, then you try to actually blow out through the straw right after you finish this circular operation. I should mention also that don't inhale before you do this because you'll have too much air. So in other words, I've exhaled, but I still have a little bit of air, so... And let it all go out so that there is a break in the back. That's okay, in the beginning. Okay. Now once you can actually do that, then you can try to overlap. So in other words, before you've completely squeezed all the air out, you can actually feel that you filled your lungs and you can return to exhaling through your mouth. So in other words, And as I'm doing now, don't worry if the bubbles sort of go back and forth because you need time to do this. Now, of course, you can skip any steps that, that I'm, I'm saying. You don't have to go through all, every single step if you're doing fine. If you're not doing well, then these steps actually uh, keep you sort of on track. So once you can do that, then you can practice actually being more efficient. And this is ideally what should be. We should ideally we have around three seconds of air in our cheeks. And you probably need one second, maybe a second and a half, maybe less even, to inhale. So again, remember, you just put the, the straw right on the edge. And you so I'm going to blow out first. Then I inflate the cheeks. I do the operation for about a second. I'm finished. And then I go back to breathing normally, through the exhaling normally through the straw, I should say. So here. And you may notice that I'm trying to keep the bubbles even, the sort of ringing, okay? And that will actually be the sign that the air is smoothly moving between regular blowing and the circular squeezing, I should say. Uh, so that's very important. Now, with this overlap, what that means is that there will be a time when you are actually both squeezing the air and exhaling through your mouth or blowing through your mouth. 
so that it's not simply one than the other, but there is this area when you're doing both. Just like there will be a time when you're blowing normally and you inflate your cheeks. And that's the principle of circular breathing. Now, the second thing to practice once we can actually inhale this way is exhaling. And that, in fact, is quite important for the clarinet itself. And when we exhale, it's virtually the same kind of uh, procedure. It's just rather than going in through your nose, you go out through your nose while the air in your cheeks is being pushed out. So this air in your cheeks has no relationship to actually inhaling and exhaling. It's just being pushed by the muscles around here. So here we go. That's in. That's out. I combine them. And you should do this and practice until it can become very calm while you're doing this. Then the issue, of course, is to come to the clarinet. And I know many people say, well, I can do it with the straw, I can do it with the water, but when I get to the clarinet, I can't do it. Okay, uh, first, you need patience. And you also need to remember, and I have it here, luckily, a rubber band. And that's because if we remember very early, when I was talking about this kind of isometric force that we need, which we scoop, we stretch this way, and that creates the tension that we actually need that this is critical for circular breathing. So the embouchure that I'm talking about with this stretch here, and that other exercise, remember, and even with the reed here, is all of this where we're feeling this, this kind of counter forces, these counter forces which actually create a proper channel for the air in a proper way that we, uh, I would say, turbocharge the air to get through the instrument well, is critical for, for circular breathing. Uh, so I take the clarinet, let's see if my read is still okay. Uh, I did, but oh, the clarinet is so cold. Yeah. Uh, too much air conditioning, but I think outside it's probably 100 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. <laughs> stretching that way, for circular breathing, it's very important that we have that stretch. Because what usually happens to people, I do this again here, because they try to do it, but they squeeze this way, and of course you block the reed, you, you don't have enough mouthpiece in your mouth, all the stuff that we've been talking about, which hopefully should not happen, happens. And of course, you go, oh well. I guess I can't really circular breathe. But the stretch I'm stretching.
magic that's a counterforce, which uh, counters the the propensity to for this to close like that, is actually what will enable you to control circular breathing on the clarinet. In, however, in the beginning, I do recommend if you have another instrument, kind of wind instrument, uh, that is a reed instrument is is good, or maybe. Uh, some kind of toy or something like that. It's good to practice on some on that in the beginning because you don't care how you sound. And I learned how to circle be very early as a young teenager. And the best thing, of course, is to learn circular breathing as you are beginning to learn how to play. Uh, for instance, in Indian classical music, you have an, an Indian oboe, and that's actually what I learned on, to circular breathe on, it's Chennai, and I don't have it here, but you may remember it from uh, one of the live streams, I have it propped up very nicely. Uh, so, in the Chennai, when you learn in, from a master in India, you start out with a, a Suruti, I think it's called, I hope that I, my memory is correct on all of this, and that just has one pitch, and that plays the drone. And this drone is very important, of course, in Indian music. This is a uh, Hindustani music, as, uh, uh, which is what I was a devotee of when I was a teenager. Uh, and you learn as an apprentice to circular breathe in order to play this sruti. So this circular breathing and learning the instrument happens at the same time. And I think this is makes a lot of sense because the biggest problem we have now is many of us, or maybe most of us, when we start to learn how to circular breathe, we've already learned basic techniques at least, and probably more than that, and what we are mostly doing is actually kind of improving these techniques, refining them, making them uh, more uh, spontaneous, etc., etc., but we're not actually learning something very new. And with circular breathing is something very new. So the level is that of real, just simply beginner all the way down here where you probably can't see at all. And the rest of us is here, and we have to move up that way. So we need patience to do that. And we need patience to develop strength in the muscles in order to do this. And I, I suggest to some instrument we don't care about how we sound really because in the beginning it's going to sound really pretty terrible. Okay, but going on to the clarinet itself, what we can do is repeat the steps, and we will do this with any instrument that we choose, to repeat the steps which we used when we were using the straw and water. So you start with the and in order to do that, I can, on the instrument clarinet, I feel we can hold it here. We fly this way. And again, you know, just squeeze too much is fine. So that you can... And then you stretch your mouth and squeeze the air out. And if you have trouble, you use your hands. That way. It's going to sound like that. It's not going to be a lot of time that you do. That's fine. And then you do the second step, which is actually inhaling while you do this. That way. And probably it will be very fast in the beginning. And that's okay, because you just have to get used to the process. So, again, that way. And then little by little, you get more used to this. So you find like, you can do that. And then you start to actually incorporate that into the actual production of the sound. So, and as I did right now, don't worry if the sound stops, anything like that. This is actually normal in the beginning. And you just keep doing this and feel that you can actually have more and more air in your cheeks because finally you do need this kind of three seconds worth so you can finally
actually do that. Now for the secret. When I circular breathe, I involve the tongue as well. A bit. And it's from the back of the tongue, and it sort of goes, yeah, yeah, like that. So the back goes up. If this is the top palate, and this is the front of the mouth, even though it doesn't look like that, sort of the, so goes from back this way, yeah, yeah. So it also focuses the air. And I should mention that there's another way to circular breathe. It's virtually the same thing, except rather than using the cheeks to squeeze, you just use the tongue, the back, the, basically the tongue, pushing forward to do that. And uh, I think oboists often use that kind of uh, circular breathing because oboists need almost no air. Uh, so here we go. You know that, and I can do. Virtually with the tongue, but you don't have the flexibility with the cheeks. And if you're playing forcefully loud, you have to circular breathe, you may not even have enough air. So I use the tongue as a helper. something there and that actually is not so different from when we play and we stretch our mouth by actually changing the positioning of the tongue going this way uh, and once again I emphasize that I'm telling you a lot of information that you try it and if something works it's correct you cannot think that it's, it's working right but it's not but I'm doing it incorrectly. Of course, by the same token, if it's not working well, you cannot say, well, I'm doing everything right, but it's not working. Of course, there's something which is not right. So you have to get the result. Once you get the result, then you'll actually understand what I'm talking about. Uh, okay, so this is basically circular breathing. And as you gain control of the embouchure here, you will be able to circular breathe throughout the instrument. Of course, when you get the very high register, it becomes more difficult, but it's possible to do that. And that can happen, but you can guard against that also. Things like that, even here. but I can circular breathe all the way up to there. Uh, and you can circular breathe in different passages. So if I... with me. I also have a lot of new reads, which I hope will work better. So this is one of the old reads uh, that way. Then I go very quickly over two more things, which are actually much more difficult perhaps, and they, they will come later. But it is very possible to tongue, to articulate, and circular breathe. And uh, again, what you need most important is to have developed the strength in the embouchure so that you can hold things in positions as you're doing something else than this. So, uh, here we go. I try this. 
This is good enough for a demonstration, uh, and uh, that just goes to show that even at my stage, it's important to practice. Finally, you can even kind of double tongue and circular breathe, which is, involves a kind of cheating, and he just goes fast for that. So, here, I will try this, and let's see if I can fall on my face right now. I'll just do a little bit. to show you and perhaps next week if I have it in me I will uh, talk about double tonguing articulation and even circular breathing and double tonguing and perhaps I'll play this whole thing for you if I find time to practice it uh, so I think that's it for this be well everyone take care if you have questions actually just contact me and I'll be very very happy to answer whatever questions you have okay bye bye now